All right, continuing on to part two of Revivalism, The Devil's Design. If you'd like to follow along, you can go to the website, creationliberty.com, type in the word revival, R-E-V-I-V-A-L, into the search bar, and you'll find an article called Revivalism, The Devil's Design. Or if you're listening by YouTube, you can click the link in the description, and that'll take you, uh, if you scroll down some, and it'll take you to the article, you just have to scroll down some to get where we left off. So last week we left off talking about Charles Finney, and how he denied the gospel of Jesus Christ in every sense. He doesn't believe anything about the Christian God of the Bible, really. And now we're going to get into a bit of example to show you the kind of things that are going to come out of the mouths of these revivalists. And again, like I said in the last part, I'm not just talking about these televangelist revivals. I'm talking about the average local tent revival that a church building will have. Okay, None of this is biblical. They're all following after a man who was not a Christian, who was anti-Christ in his teaching, and he did it, he, he developed the system only to gain popularity. Okay? That not, not of himself necessarily, but he's trying to grow churches by bringing more people into church buildings. That is not getting them saved, that's just changing their agenda, basically. It's just changing their schedule. Okay, on this one day, you need to come here for an hour. Well, that doesn't, that doesn't convert anybody, okay, no matter how fired up you might get them. And so what I did is I found uh, this first guy we're going to talk about. Now, I, I remember when I was writing this, I basically had to sit down, catch my breath, try not to get anxiety, and say, okay, Chris, let's just bite the bullet. And so I went to YouTube and looked up tent revivals, and I just started pouring through videos and it was probably, I would say, one of the most stressful things I've ever done in research and writing as an author in my life. Having to listen to these guys. Sitting there all afternoon taking recording of, you know, documenting what I needed from what. and uh, it, was a, it was a nightmare. But it's over for now. <laughs> okay, hopefully I don't have to listen to too much more of that. Because I can't stand it. But one man I found, uh, his name was Ron Carpenter, and he started off his tent revival preaching by describing what he saw when looking at people in the world around him. Okay, here's what he said, quote, We see people that are so unsure and insecure about where they're at in the world today, end quote. Now, of course, let me, let me back this up a little, because what they do is they always say this in their sanctimonious tone. Okay, if you now if you don't know what a sanctimonious tone is, I guess if I, <laughs> sanctimonious, um, I guess to define that it would mean because I don't even think the dictionary gives a good definition of it. The dictionary would say would say that it's uh, in a in a way of speaking that is holy and sanctified. I, I I actually disagree with that definition. I don't think that's correct. It is to give the perception of being holy and sanctified. See, because people's per perception of what they believe is holy and sanctified, or what holy and sanctified sounds like, comes from their original education. See, if they, are, if they were taught that a person's voice, the way that it sounds, is sanctimonious, then that's what they're going to believe is sanctimonious. So a sanctimonious tone would be something like... Um, you know, I bought a car and I got a great deal. You know, that sentence saying that. Uh, for me to say it in a sanctimonious tone would be like, I bought a car and I got a great deal. You know, that's, that's the kind of sanctimonious tone that comes through. So when he says this, he says things like, we see people that are so unsure and insecure about where they're at in the world today. You see, that's the way they do this. And of course... When they say things like that, I mean, what does the crowd do? They go, Amen, brother! That's the way these go. You guys have seen these. You guys know how these work. So, what they end up doing is saying things in a way that give people the portrayal that what they're saying is like walking on holy ground. But much of what they say, if you would actually slow it down or record it and simply write out a script, 
Okay, and this is one of the ways, one of the reasons I love why the Bible. You see, God through His infinite power could have made made it to where anytime somebody writes down a, a true page of His Word. A, a, a button would just mystically appear and you could press it and it would give you audio recording of it. Okay, he could have made it like that, but he didn't, all right? And that's why I love that his word is just written on paper so you can read it for what it says and get the understanding of it. But you can't a lot in these kind of tent revivals. But if you actually write down what they're saying, it actually makes no sense. Because as soon as he said that sentence, we see people in the that are so unsure and insecure about where they're at in the world today, I was shaking my head, no. Everybody else in the audience was going, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm going, no, 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 that's not correct. And you see, the people were just shaking their heads, yes, because we live in a nation of arrogance and blissful ignorance and pride and, and, and respecting persons, and so it, it, they're just going to go along with what they hear. But it's because of that that type of attitude of that that arrogance and blissful ignorance and the pride and all the and respecting persons that's why people aren't looking for a savior okay because even if they do look for a savior that savior is typically a man it's not the lord god it's not the lord jesus christ like a government leader or a religious leader a pastor or a priest or something like that and the bible does i mean it's not only that I'm saying that if you, because you look around at the world today, I mean, is that what you guys see when you look at things like, you know, people and their American Idol junk and all the stuff you see in TV and movies and Hollywood and rock stars? And Do you see th people that are unsure and insecure? Because I don't. When I'm looking around at people, that is not at all what I see. I see very few people like that. So, not only can you see just with your own eyes what he's saying is wrong. Not only am I telling you what he's saying is wrong, the Bible says what he's saying is wrong. If you go back to Romans chapter 1, and you start in verse 23, it says, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. They don't, they don't sit back and think that, oh, we're unsure and insecure. They're thinking, we know. We already know this stuff. And how dare you tell me that I'm a sinner? I'm a good person. See, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools, and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man, and to birds, and to four-footed beasts, and creeping things. Creation? Nah, nah. That involves God. Evolution makes a whole lot more sense. Well, let's just kind of fuse them together. You know, just like the pagans and the Jews, let's fuse them together and come up with the Kabbalah. Oh, take that Christian doctrine of the New Testament and paganism, let's fuse them together and we get Catholicism. I mean, there's corruption everywhere, okay? They take the uncorruptible God and they make into an image of corruptible man. Wherefore, God also gave them up to the uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts. I mean, he gave them up to it. He says, fine, you want all that? Have it. Suffer the consequences. Because he promised us there are consequences to the lust of our own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves, who changed the truth of God into a lie and worship and serve the creature more than the Creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this cause, God gave them up to vile affections, for even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. They're talking about lesbians, by the way. And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust toward one another, men working with men working that which is unseemly. That's talking about homosexuals, the gays, right? And receiving in themselves that recompense of their error, which was meat. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. He gave them over to it. He says, fine, you want it, then you're going to suffer the consequences. You're going to suffer the curses that are going to follow. All right. Being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whispers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implicable, unmerciful. Did you hear the words unsure and insecure anywhere in there? Or any 
synonyms that were even close to those adjectives? No. Because God is telling us what is in the hearts of man. Who? He's talking about these kinds of people who have all these things in their heart who knowing the judgment of God. Because remember, the law of God is written on their hearts. By their very own conscience are they judged. And they said, yeah, but people, like so there's some mass murderers who don't think murder's wrong. They know murder's wrong. They know what they're doing is wrong. They do have a conscience. They know. How do I know they know? Because the Bible says they know. They know what they're doing is wrong, but they ignore it anyway. Who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. They gather to themselves everybody who does the same thing. Why do you think drug addicts flock together? Why do you think drinkers flock together? Why do you think fornicators flock together? Why do you think that if you're among them and you don't do the same thing, you're kind of outcast? It's what they call you know, the peer pressure situations. Why do you think that happens? The Bible's describing it here. The problem is that in almost all of these tent revivals, the purpose is to give people a positive, feel-good message, not to teach the truth. Folks, you're unsure and insecure, and Jesus is the way. I got some good news. I got this good message for you. Here's the good news right here. That's what they do, don't they? There's no repentance involved. In order to have repentance involved, there has to be fault. There has to be guilt. There has to be something that was wrong. It's a negative type conversation that people don't want to have. You bring a negative conversation in, you're going to find yourself without a crowd. If you've got a big tent and a microphone and you're the only one there, doesn't feel too good, does it? Now, despite the fact that these pastors of these revival tents, they claim they want to save souls. That's what they talk about all the time. We want to reignite people's passion for Jesus. Rededicate your life to Jesus. Let's save souls. Let's get them in there. Let's do all that, right? The true purpose is to gather a crowd. They want to gather a crowd. They want to bring in donations and hype up an enthusiastic herd of cattle that will flock to save the dying church building with open wallets. I don't care what they tell you. I don't care what they say. I don't care how they advertise it. That is the purpose because that's the reason Charles Finney started it to begin with. And that's why people have carried it on. In fact, later on, probably not in this teaching, probably in the next part, we're going to show you how, back then, testimonies were given that the revivalism movement was not working. It was having the opposite effect. But it maintained its popularity among preachers because it brought in funding. Even if it was temporary, it brought in funding. And that's why people nowadays, what they do is they do revivalism tours, like we talked about in part one. Because if you just keep it going all the time, the money keeps flowing. Assuming that you do the positivity, feel-good message in the right way that tickles people's ears and makes them feel good, right? So, if you at all teach that the Bible's condemnation of sin, people are going to leave these tents. They won't stick around. And that doesn't make people feel good. And that's why Christ taught us individual evangelism, not massive tents and sound systems, okay? I'm not saying that necessarily having a sound system or a tent or anything is wrong. I'm saying that that... I mean, you... Okay, let's put out a bunch of advertisements. We're going to have a big tent. We're going to get a massive sound system and gather people in. Show me scriptural precedence for that. Okay, because I... I haven't seen it. <laughs> Uh, the more I have read scripture, the more I have seen individual evangelism from grassroots. And I, I just don't understand how people can sit back and say this is biblically justified when there's nothing in the Bible to justify it. The only thing they're trying to justify, they're desperately trying to find anything they can to justify it because it comes down to money and attendees, or, uh, uh, yeah, attendance, right? It's uh, attendance meaning that 
you're you're increasing a church building's attendance, which actually leads to more money. So all of it in, it comes down to the love of money. That's what the entire revival is moving. That's what revival tents are all about. So there's more evidence of Carpenter's, Ron Carpenter we were just talking about, but there's more evidence of his true purpose when he said, we got a little bit more evidence here, he says, quote, I'm not here to preach to the churched, I'm here to preach to the unchurched, end quote. So, wait a second, because <laughs> the church and unchurched, why isn't he talking about, I'm here to preach to the lost, not to the saved? Why didn't he say that? Well, that's because he's not really there to preach to the lost, is he? He wants those who are not going to a church to come to his. That's his goal. Because if you want to save souls, what, what do you do? You give them the law. I mean, generally speaking, from a Christian perspective, that's what we believe that we should, that should be our primary objective, to save souls, right? And that the law of the Lord is perfect converting the soul, it says in Psalm. But that's not what Ron Carpenter was doing. He's not there to save souls. He's there to get the unchurched into his church. It's bonus attendance, which is more money. And that's Psalm, by the way, Psalm 19.7. That's where the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. And the testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. Well, if the Bible says that, why don't we trust in God's word? If it's perfect, converting the soul, then let's use it. Now, what Carpenter said there is exactly what false teachers like Rick Warren and Robert Schuller have said. That their focus was not lost versus saved, it was church versus unchurched. And you got to keep an out, Christians, listen very carefully, you've got to keep an ear out for those key words of purpose and unchurched, because you're going to hear those a lot, or churched or unchurched, something like that. And these New Age cults, they do this all the time. If you guys don't know enough about that, anybody listening out there, uh, go onto our website, creationliberty.com, type in the word Warren, W-A-R-R-E-N, into the search bar, you're going to find an article called Wolves in Costume, Rick Warren, and that will explain a lot more about the hidden cult aspects by giving an example of the, the false and deceptive purpose-driven church Rick Warren has created. So while Ron Carpenter is still yelling into the microphone, because this is all building up, right? He starts off relatively in a semi-sanctimonious tone, and it gets more and more intense, and they get into yelling in the microphone. Ron Carpenter continues to say the following, quote, Some of this you're not going to understand. All you're going to understand is there is a longing in your heart to live a different life, end quote. When I heard that, I said no, 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 no. He is not teaching the Bible here. But, of course, what does the audience do? Hey, man! They're just yelling. They don't even know what they're saying. This is a crowd of willingly blind churchgoers who have no idea what's even being talked about. Now, it shouldn't be surprising, because even if you were sitting in that audience, you might miss it. Because of the... I mean, there, there is a kind of a reverberation of emotions that happen that can bounce off of you and influence you when you're in a large crowd like that. That's how riots get started. As anger, anger builds, everybody's anger resonates among each other, and that's how riots end up starting and people end up doing things that they normally would never do because people are resonating. That's why you can see something that is completely unfunny, but if you're sitting in an audience, like at a movie theater or a comedy club or something, and there's a big audience... The same thing can appear to be funny when it's totally not funny based on everybody laughing around you because that reverberates. That's why we have to be careful about our emotions because they can be so deceiving. So, anyway, Carpenter's appeal to the unchurched is actually about changing earthly lives. Okay, Because what did he say? He says, there's a logging in your heart for Jesus? No, there's a logging in your heart to live a different life. Something different than, than what you're, you know, you're not really satisfied and um, you're just looking for something else, right? Against that positivity message that attracts the crowd and brings extra money to those offering plates. This so-called pastor is claiming that these people are longing for God, seeking after God, and they just don't know it. So they need this fiery revival preacher to tell them about it. 
and he brings in a Jesus is better than beer mentality that creates false converts. Because listen to what the Bible says about it. Because he, because Ron Carpenter said, all you understand, there's a longing in your heart to live a different life. Well, let's look at Romans chapter 3, starting in verse 10. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. Their throat is an open sepulcher. With their tongues they have used deceit. The poison of asps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways. And the way of peace have they not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know that what what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped, and all the world may become guilty before God. So what my Bible says is that you are you don't understand, that you are not righteous, you do not seek after God, and you are guilty before him. But you see, that's not the positive message that helps gather people to his tent. People have to be converted. And they can't, they can't be converted without repentance. They can only be convinced that they need to come up and go to this guy's church building. And if they want to live a different life, you should try Jesus. You know, let's put him on a 30-day probation trial and give you a money-back guarantee on it. <laughs> That's the way they're treating this. There's no conversion process happening because the methods that God set up for us Christians to use and to preach are being abandoned by the false church in favor of an anti-Christian Charles Finney's biblical traditions to put in its place. Here's some more statements that Carpenter made. He said, quote, Without the word of God, you will die a miserable death, end quote. Many Christian martyrs, including the disciples of Christ, died a miserable death with the word of God. How many were stoned to death? How many were put in prison? How many had horrible lives? <laughs> we were not promised an amazing life and a wonderful death. But, they, but God has promised us eternal security but only to those who have repented in godly sorrow and been born again. And again, when I talk about repentance, I'm talking about the grief and godly sorrow. That's what repentance is concerning salvation. If you don't understand that, type in the word repent, R-E-P-E-N-T, into the search bar at creationliberty.com. You'll get an article called, Is Repentance Part of Salvation? Make sure you understand the biblical definitions. Because if you think repent means to turn or to turn from sin and that's it, then you have no idea what the Bible says about repentance. And you need to get a full understanding of it. So Ron Carpenter, later, he starts yelling, he yells this into the microphone, quote, When boats take on water, they don't float too good. The bottom line is, if the boat don't float, you better know how to swim, end quote. And of course, what does the audience do? Hey, man, brother! <laughs> I, really? I guess... I gotta laugh at this because I don't know what else to do. I mean, it's almost as if this is something you ought to crochet this wording into a blanket because the crowd treated his sentence as if these were the greatest and wisest words a man has ever spoken. I mean, this is one of the dumbest statements I've ever heard. I mean, let me read this without any sanctimonious tone. When boats take on water, they don't float too good. The bottom line is, if the boat don't float, you better know how to swim. Do not five-year-old children understand that if a boat takes on water, it will sink? Yeah, I had toys in the bathtub, and that was one of the features of it, is where it would take on water, and you'd let it sink, and you'd bring it back up out of the water again. And all. I mean, you figure that out pretty early on. Do not children understand that if you're in water without a boat, you need to swim or you will drown? Uh, yeah. They, I think they get that. 
I mean, the crowd is so blinded by their emotions, they believe these words are equivalent to wisdom. I mean, Paul talked about to you know, the church in Corinth in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 17. He says, For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. See, Paul was pointing out that people claimed to be of Paul instead of Christ. That was the context of what was going on. Just as people today, they put themselves under a church building's name or a preacher's banner rather than under Christ. Now, Paul points out here that he's not preaching with wisdom of words other, and like these little cutesy phrases and anecdotes and all that and these play on words that's going to, you know, tickle the ears of men. And, oh, oh I like that. The, you know, because what people end up doing is they say, oh, my preacher's so wise. Oh, we follow him because he gives me all these lines and... and I heard this coming out of church building. Oh, did you hear? I like this thing that preacher said the other day, or he talked about this. I mean, they're not really preaching the word as much as they're preaching their anecdotes. And every revival I've, I've ever heard does pretty much the exact same thing. What Paul was saying is that he taught directly from the word of God and made sure that it was keeping that the focal point. I try to do the same thing. I don't know if I'm very successful or not. I, I try to do my best to make the Word of God the focal point of what I'm doing, so that way I don't make the cross of Christ of none effect, because I could be guilty of doing the same thing. That's why, guys, I could speak in that, talk in that sanctimonious tone. I could do these teachings in that same way if I wanted to, but why? what's the point? I want, I want people to have understanding not just be amazed with how charismatic I can speak. I mean, I can get on here and be like, you're now listening to that sweet audible candy that is my voice. I mean, why, why would I want to do that to deceive people? I mean, I can, I can do all that radio voice stuff and everything. Who, who cares? If you don't get understanding of the Word of God, all of it's for nothing. And all that does is it baits people in with worldly tactics who rely on worldly things. I mean, Carpenter, at the beginning of his sermon, I remember this, he said that God directly told him to preach that message. What, I was, what I've just quoted you from him, he says God told him to preach that message. I mean... But the, the crowd's in such a fit of emotion, he could say almost anything he wants. And the crowd would say, Amen, as if they could no, no longer understand his words. He's not bringing any biblical understanding to this. Okay? Like, you, you get the crowd worked up enough to where they don't even care what you're saying. They're just yelling, Amen, everything. You can just sit back and preach, when dolphins turn green, when your hairspray comes with luxury features, when your rear axle causes the French Revolution, Jesus, 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 amen! It doesn't make any sense. What's the point of saying these things? But you see, they get away with it. Because people come to be entertained. You see, and when they're drawn in with entertainment, when they're drawn into a church building with entertainment, then what do they keep coming to the church building for? Entertainment. If they're not getting enough of it, or they can find somewhere else to get it, like, say, stay at home and watch TV, well, that's what they'll end up doing. Because they're going to go to the place that has the most entertainment. If people are converted and actually drawn in by the Holy Spirit, they will keep coming back because of the Holy Spirit. Then you don't have to have follow-ups. Then you don't have to keep checking up on them, and then you don't have to keep luring them back in with entertainment. But they don't get this. And that all they do with all these just all these unbiblical sayings, things that don't make any sense, they're just causing confusion. 1 Corinthians 14, 33, for God is not the author of confusion, but of peace as in all churches of the saints. God is not the author of confusion. Now, of course, those verses are talking about the speaking in tongues, which is the speaking in different languages, okay? Not that, you know, New Age gibberish nonsense that people are doing. But that kind of thing had to be taken with the utmost seriousness when people were speaking in different languages because Christians need to be given understanding from the Word of God. If people speak in a language that is unknown, it sounds like gibberish. 
and no understanding is gained. That's why Paul, if you go back to 1 Corinthians 14, starting in uh, chapter 14, starting in verse 14, he says, For if I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit prayeth, but my understanding is unfruitful. I had rather speak five words with my understanding, that by my voice I might teach others also, than ten thousand words in an unknown tongue. See, the whole purpose of speaking in a clear language, everyone present can understand, is for that one reason, so they can understand. Yelling out random phrases that don't make any sense serves no function in the church. But often, these people just start screaming and saying stuff, thinking that every noise that comes out of their mouths is directly like a channel from Jesus Christ. And that's why Paul said in 1 Corinthians 14, 40, let all things be done decently and in order, okay? And there's more verses than than just that we're going to get to later on some of the things about all their loudness and, and, and what they do there is there's really a, there's a lot of offense to scripture on that. But the Bible warns us that men were going to come with feel good words and charismatic speeches to deceive the hearts of the simple minded, you know, serving the God of their belly, their grumbling stomach to feed it with, you know, the money thrown at them for their entertaining dialogue. And Romans 16, 18 says, for they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ. It doesn't say they serve him in part and then they're kind of messing up in this area. They said they don't serve him at all, but their own belly. It's their grumbling stomach. They want to make sure they have money and a paycheck and by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. These men don't learn how to preach good words and fair speeches from the Bible. They don't learn it from the Word of God. They didn't learn that from the Lord Jesus Christ. They didn't learn it from Christ's apostles and their letters in the Bible. They learned it from the traditions of men. They're repeating what they have been taught and what they have heard. That's all they're doing. Colossians 2.8 Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. It's those traditions that are making the word of God of none effect. I mean, they're doing these things by people who taught, you know, somebody taught them that, and then the person that taught them, you know, their father taught them that, and their father learned it from another man who went, goes all the way back to Charles Finney, who invented the whole thing. Now, often these church tent revivals talk about miracles happening in church tents. Oh, there's a miracle here. There's a miracle coming. God's going to provide miracles here. That's the way they always, they always talk about this. I hear them do it all the time. It's very interesting that Charles Finney, who started this whole thing, stated that the revivalist movement has nothing to do with miracles. I bet they didn't know that, did they? And he says that it has everything to do with pragmatism. Now, when I say pragmatism, usually when you hear the word pragmatism or pragmatic, just think of the word practical. Okay, something that is practical for use, right? And practical will probably be a good description of the revivalist tense in the first place. It's a practical way they can earn more money and gain more attendance. It's practical, right? Here's what he said from his lectures on uh, Charles Finney, from lectures on the revivals of religion. He said, quote, A revival of religion is not a miracle. A miracle has been generally defined to be a divine interference setting aside or suspending the laws of nature. It is not a miracle in this sense. All the laws of matter and mind remain in force. They are neither suspended nor set aside in a revival. It is not a miracle according to another definition of the term miracle, something above the powers of nature. There is nothing in religion beyond the ordinary powers of nature. Now, wait a second, let me back that up and reread that, because you may have missed it, since I I was going a little bit fast there. He says, there is nothing in religion beyond the ordinary powers of nature. So you see how Charles Finney, what he believed is that God created everything. He, He likely believes that, I don't know. Maybe he didn't. But then God took his hands off, and God's not involved after that point. 
That's his belief system. He, he could not make a statement like that if that's not what he believed. He continues to say, It consists entirely in the right exercise of the powers of nature. It is just that and nothing else. When mankind becomes religious, they are not enabled to put forth exertions which they were unable before to put forth. They only exert the powers they had before in a different way and use them for the glory of God. It is not a miracle or dependent on a miracle in any sense. It is a purely philosophical result of the right use of the constituted means as so much so as any other effect produced by the application of means. End quote. So, to try to understand what he's, what he's saying here, because that, that does sound a little convoluted the way he, he approached it. He's saying that revivalists do whatever is necessary to achieve a desired goal. Even if it goes against scripture, it doesn't matter. Okay. So it, what he's trying to say is that the end justifies the means, which is unbiblical. Okay. The end does not justify the means. All right. A lot of the means is incredibly important in what we do, right? We may be trying to raise money for something, but that doesn't mean we go rob a bank. The end, the end does not justify the means. So when Finney says that revivalism is a purely philosophical result of the right use of constituted means, he's saying that he is altering people's way of thinking by using an established method that he, he has invented and by his preface, this invented method did not rely on scripture and the knowledge of God, but rather his own pragmatic interpretation, his own practical interpretation of how to accomplish the goal he had in mind. So he says, however we can get more attendance and more money, that's what we're going to do. And that's how he developed revivalism and tent revivals and the things that people are still using today. In fact, when Finney said, quote, there is nothing in religion beyond the ordinary powers of nature, end quote, it, it means he doesn't believe in miracles at all. I mean, he, does, he just doesn't believe in miracles. He, he also doesn't believe that God is much involved with the business of mankind. And that's why I just mentioned a little bit ago. I think I was getting a little bit ahead of myself, though. But that God took his hands off after creation, Right. It's very similar to what a theistic evolutionist believes. Very close to that. So, in combination with everything else we've just read from Finney, this means that he invented revivalism under the presupposition that men are saved, in quotations, the very same way that you change a flat tire. See, there's no divine intervention involved. And this is for, that the further evidence of a statement when he said, quote, as, so, as much so as any other effect produced by the application of means, end quote. Which means it is a man-centered gospel message that he built, which was handed down from preacher to preacher to preacher to preacher, and that's why we see these tent revivals as they appear today. And that's why they do all the same things. They got it from him. He developed an unbiblical, man-centered message to get more people to attend because he believed that people are saved the same way you change a flat tire. So, anyway, for those of you who are a, a Bible-believing, studying Christian who's born again, if you've ever been to one of these revivals or you've watched a video of one, something along those lines, Typically, when you're watching it or you're looking at it, you're going to get red warning lights that are going to go off in the back of your mind that something is very wrong, okay? The Holy Spirit should be giving you conviction on the stuff that something's not right here. And if you've ever had that when you've been at them, hopefully what I just explained to you from Charles Finney is now really going to set in of why you were discerning, you had that discerning danger sense from the Holy Spirit that was warning you that this is wrong. I mean, the, the people emotionally engrossed in these tent revivals have been blinded to such a degree that God's word warning against the feel-good messages being presented at these things, even if you try to explain to them, it's going to fall on deaf ears because they're like, no way my emotions could be wrong. 
because I feel the Holy Spirit. See, the Holy Spirit, I feel like this, so therefore it's the Holy Spirit. It's so dangerous. Psalm 12, starting verse 1, Help, Lord, for the godly man ceaseth, for the faithful fail among the children of men. They speak vanity, everyone with his neighbor, with flattering lips, and with a double heart do they speak. A double heart's where you say one thing and you do another. Where you're trying to you're trying to appeal to two, two different sides of things, and you're not really picking a side. So Ron Carpenter, he started getting so loud after a while listening to him, so incoherent, started jumping and running around. I, I just couldn't take any more of it. I decided to move on to the next one. So in this next video, the guy, I, I didn't get a name. I couldn't find a name for this guy. Some unnamed preacher. But the video started out in a tent with some music that it was incredibly loud. The audio was terrible. I couldn't understand because there were some children yelling into a microphone and an extremely loud drum set in the background. So I just I, I skipped ahead of it just so I could hear what they were trying to say. So during this video, they said, quote, and this, this is the preacher, by the way, he says, I want you to believe there's a miracle in here for you tonight. Why don't you grab somebody's hand tonight in the name of the Lord and tell them there is a miracle here for you in the name of Jesus, end quote. Now the problem is this is incredibly vague. What is that supposed to mean that there is a miracle for them? And why are you having everybody tell them this on your behalf? I mean, because what if that's not true? He just ever had everybody lie to everybody else. Now, for, notice first he said that he wanted them to believe it. Not that it's true, but that that preacher wants them to believe it. So he wants their faith in what he said. Not necessarily faith in what God's word has confirmed for us. Now, I don't believe this man for a second, first of all, because he's lying to these people. A lot of the reason that these preachers will use vague statements like this, where they want to generalize things, or I want you to believe this and that kind of stuff, and you'll see a lot of these vague statements that don't really have a lot of specifics to them, is that the more vague the statement is, the easier it is to sell. The more uncertain a meaning of something is when you say it, the easier it is to sell. And that's why when you see some of these big-time televangelists that go into uh, you know, CNN interviews or Oprah shows or things like that, and they say incredibly th vague things, or they just talk about God in quotations in general, the reason they're so vague is because it's easier to sell. It sells to more people. The more specific you get, the harder it is to sell. So just like every other revivalist preacher, this pastor tells everyone that God sent him there to preach this message to them. Wow. Every single one of them. I guess God must have sent every single person that calls himself a preacher and no one can be wrong because everybody claims that God sent them there to do that. <laughs> I'm just praying that people have discernment over this stuff. Anyway, he said he also said there was a prophet among them that delivered the word of God to the Christians of Savannah, Georgia. Because that's where this has taken place. They got this tent revival in Savannah, Georgia. And he said, quote, A prophet has been in the midst of you, and that these things shall come to pass. The Lord said there's a great storm coming this way to this city. And the Lord also said that there's going to be a great explosion here on the waters and that the people need to be prepared early for it to come, end quote. So they're prophesying a flood. Now, I didn't know anything about this. It's just red lights were going off in my mind when I'm listening to this. And I didn't know anything about Savannah, Georgia, because like I said, I've told you guys in past teachings, my geography is one of my weak points. You know, like names of cities and geography and stuff like that. That's why I have a hard time understanding st some stuff in the Old Testament is because of that, and I, I struggle with that sometimes. So I decided to go onto a map and look up Savannah, Georgia. And when I saw it, I was I just started laughing. Because it's so, I mean, it's so sad, I'd have to cry if I wasn't laughing at what I saw. I counted no less than eight named rivers that surround the city of Savannah. It's like there are 
if you look at the map of it, I have a picture of it on the website here, but there's a map of it where there's like, it, it looks like vines of rivers that are growing around the entire city. And it's right on, on the edge of the Atlantic Ocean. I mean, even even the coastline along Savannah is famous as a, as a hot spot tourist attraction. So, what they did... <laughs> let me put it this way. For a prophet, a so-called prophet, to come to Savannah, Georgia, and foretell the people, hey folks, there's going to be a flood, you better be prepared for it, would be like a prophet going to the Hebrew slaves in Egypt and saying, Hey folks, it's going to be hot tomorrow. Be prepared. Duh. Okay, that's what happens there. The Georgia State website has a page dedicated to Savannah flood emergencies because they happen all the time. I mean, it's it's common knowledge in that area. It's not prophecy. But the, and, and by the way, this so-called prophet, when I listened to this this video, he gave no timing whatsoever. When was this going to happen? Which means it doesn't matter. It, it was open-ended. So whenever the next flood is, in the eyes of all these ignorant churchgoers, suddenly he's like, oh, he's a true prophet of God. There was a flood that happened here. That's amazing. Really? Oh, but it gets worse. It gets worse because this preacher, after he told them this so-called prophecy this fake that about this flood coming to savannah he said it was the gift of god and then he said quote as a matter of fact look at somebody and tell them that's my miracle end quote you little rat that's all i could think of in my mind you dirty rat how dare you this makes me angry but people buy this stuff. They soak it up. Because first, he said there was a miracle there for everyone. Then he connected a miracle. He gave a prophecy about a flood in an area that's frequently known for floods. He called that a miracle and then had everybody confessed, oh, I got a miracle. So that way they couldn't walk out and said, well, I didn't get any miracle. Oh, yes, you did. You got a prophecy of a flood. That's your miracle. This was insurance for the pastor to make sure people wouldn't leave there thinking that I didn't receive a miracle. So that way he wouldn't be held accountable for his lies. How could someone that deceptive be of Christ? That makes me so angry when I hear people do stuff like that. And folks, get this. That was the first three minutes I listened to. Three minutes! This stuff goes on for hours. In another part, the preacher told everyone that the prophecies of God were not fortune-telling and that they shouldn't have to pay for them so they wouldn't be taking an offering. Well, that sure sounds good at first glance, doesn't it? He said the tent, sound equipment, property, food, and everything else they provided... He says, that was all provided for you free. Wait, wait, what? He sounds like the common average American that thinks that Medicaid is free. Or that public education is free. <laughs> Whose pocket did it come out of? Did the pastor personally pay out of his own pocket for the tent, the sound equipment, the property, the food, and everything else they provided? Did he personally pay for all that? No. I guarantee you he didn't, li he didn't put in a dime. Probably what happened was that all these things were provided by people taking offerings beforehand. Which is fine. People can give to things that they want to pay for and have put on. That's, that's their prerogative. That's, I mean, people are at liberty to do that. But the deception is his attempt to disconnect the fact that the money is still coming directly from their giving. He tries to disconnect those two things. They did pay for all of it. And he tries to say, oh, this is all free. He's trying to lure in more attendance, folks. And what happens when you get more attendance? You get more tithes, which are totally unbiblical. If you don't understand that, type in the word tithe, T-I-T-H-E, into the search bar at creationliberty.com. 
You'll get an article called, Is Tithe a Christian Requirement? Absolutely not, okay? Storehouse tithing was created in the late 1800s to try to get churches out of debt because they got into an unbiblical debt through some of the worldly junk they were trying to do, like these tent revivals. That, that was never taught in the New Testament, okay? So another preacher I was looking at, his name was Jason Kendrick, who, and he travels with his family to these unbiblical revival tents all over the country to sing and dance. He talks about the costs of them. I thought you might like to know this. He says, quote, Many have asked me how much a tent revival would cost. We have found that most churches spend an average of $2,500 total on their revival expenses. This, of course, depends on how many preachers and or if there are singers that have been invited and also the distance the rig and revival team must travel to reach the revival destination. This estimated cost is based on the revival team and evangelist only. One more time. This estimated cost is based on the revival team and evangelists only. In today's economy, one could not rent a tent with all the equipment offered for such a price. We come by faith on a love offering basis, trusting that God will meet the needs through the offerings of his people, end quote. So the $25 he's talking about is not even for the tent. This is for, this is for the team and the evangelist. And that's just for the tent setup. They still need to provide all the singers and preachers to come in from around the country, depending on how big it is. They have platforms, altars, electrical systems, PA systems, lighting, chairs, and the tent itself, and any other accommodations like food or anything else they want to include that vary in cost. As you can imagine, for someone who's paid for any of this kind of stuff, these things get pricey very quickly. I mean, we could. I mean, a church. I mean, if you think about all those different things involved, it's really easy to spend over five grand for just a weekend, and all of it to spread false doctrines with a feel-good message that are going to lead people to hell. Sounds like a real good investment, doesn't it? So, I just. I struggled watching some of these tent revival videos because it was just I was getting more frustrated as I listened to them. And there were so many things that I wanted to even include in this article, but I thought it would take so much time to break down everything they're saying. I don't think I want this to go on forever like that. You'd almost have to do it live and go through it and pause it and, and, and talk about where the problems are in order to do something like that. But they're just there to put on a show for the masses. That's all it is. And it makes me sick to my stomach to watch, and I really don't want to watch it anymore. I only suffered through these because I wanted to demonstrate the point to people. And it didn't take me very long, in, I mean, I went through a lot of different videos, but it didn't take me long in the videos to start finding the problems. It took a few minutes. But some of these people stay with these church buildings for years and years doing this, and are, can't see one bit of it because they are blinded by the veils of their own leaven and sin. I just pray that God would give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth so they can be redeemed and saved out of the snare of the devil. So we're taken captive at him by his will, the Bible says. I just pray that that would happen for people. I'm hoping this teaching will do that for somebody, but I don't know. I'm, I'm doing what I know how to do. That's all I can do. Now, one man I listened to, he seemed to be teaching repentance to salvation, which I thought, hey, that's great. You know, when I first started watching him, I was like, that's not too bad. But then, I just kept listening, just keep listening a little bit longer. He then pointed out, through all of his yelling when he started doing it, that they needed to put on a prayer shawl, which is a Jewish tradition not recognized by the New Testament church and scripture. In other videos, he also used the tradition of altar calls to his in his revivals, which are also not found in scripture. They are never recognized by the New Testament church and scripture. Uh, even though repentance was being taught, the problem was that it was not being taught as godly sorrow, but turning from sin. So he wasn't even teaching it the right way. And it ends up being another workspace doctrine, saying you must turn from all sin in order to be saved. But the Bible teaches us that we are saved while we are in our sinful state. So there again is the problem. Now I'd like to remind people of Luke uh, chapter 18, starting in verse 9, where it says, And he spake this parable unto certain 
which trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one, the one a Pharisee and the other a publican. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank thee that I am not as the other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. I fast twice in the week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And the publican, standing far off, uh, far off, would not lift up so much his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you that this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For every one that exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. That is repentance, folks. That is an excellent example of repentance. And that's the attitude we ought to approach things as Christians. Now before I, I close out today, because we're, we're just on part two, we're going to do a part three next week, I do want to mention about the unbiblical altar calls. You see, the altar call is never found in Scripture. And it's, it's neither the design of the bench found at the forefront of most church buildings and sanctuaries. I mean, that's never found in Scripture either. If it's not in Scripture, how did it get implemented? Well, sadly, the revivalism movement is the instigator of that problem. Now, the following author, he documents the history behind altars... And this is from a book called Pagan Christianity, Exploring the Roots of Our Church Practices. I have heard from some people and said, I've never read this book in its entirety. I've heard some people say, oh, there's, there's bad stuff in this book. Maybe there is. I don't know. But they were documenting some history on the, the altars, and I found that very fascinating. So in this it says, quote, In 1807 in England, the Methodists created the Mourner's Bench. Anxious sinners now had a place to mourn for their sins when they were invited to walk down the sawdust trail. This method reached the United States a few years later and was given the name the Anxious Bench by Charles Finney. The Anxious Bench was located in the front where preachers stood on an erected platform. It was there that both sinners and needy saints were called forward to receive the minister's prayers. Finney's method was to ask those who wished to be saved to stand up and come forward. Finney made this method popular, so popular that, after 1835, it was an indispensable fixture of modern revivals. In time, the anxious bench in the outdoor camp meeting was replaced by the altar in church buildings, the sawdust trail was replaced by the church aisle, and so was born the famous altar, altar call, end quote. So even the design of the typical church building you see today is centered around the revivalist movement by a man who didn't even believe in the Christian God of the Bible. So you mean you have your, your pagan altar that they have in there because they still have them. I see them all the time. You'll get the pagan symbols that they'll have. They'll have a giant cross up there, which is the pagan symbol that was designed from the Ankh, okay? Which is the, the Ankh is what's used by witch doctors. It's used a lot in, in Egyptian paganism and witchcraft. If you don't know enough about that, Type in the word symbol, S-Y-M-B-O-L, into the search bar at creationliberty.com. You will find an article called Christian Symbols Are Not Christian. Find out what that actually means. So they put all those on there. They put their candles on to represent their incense. And then you have your, your anxious benches. And oftentimes you'll have these chief seats sitting on top of these elevated platforms where these pews are. And that's the chief seats in the synagogues that it talks about in Mark chapter 12, verse 39. Okay, that they love to have the preeminence among men. Bringing people up to an altar call is a way to psychologically influence the crowd into accepting what they see as legitimate change or conversion. The evidence of real conversion needs to be witnessed by the words and actions of the convert to Christianity over a period of time. But that time frame is too long to accomplish Finney's pragmatic goal of church growth. You see, he wanted the numbers right now. And when you actually befriend a new brother and sister in Christ and you spend time with them and you study with them, that does not result in the immediate numbers that he's looking for. It wasn't practical enough. Displays in front of a church crowd help to establish excitement in the heat of the moment. But most of the time, these so-called converts end up right back where they started a week later. 
and almost no one in the revivalist church buildings is willing to talk about it. This happens all the time. And people very rarely bring it up. If they do bring it up, what are the solutions? What should we do? And they think tweaking this or tweaking that, or maybe we should entertain people a little more in the church or something, they think that's going to fix the thing and they won't get rid of the revivalist movement junk that they've adopted, which is really causing the problem. Now, even if they do talk about it, I mean, the solution is never to own up to the truth. It's to abandon, they and just abandon the unbiblical revivalist movement. They just follow follow up with people. That's one of the things. Well, we need more follow up. Why do you have to follow up with someone who is of the Holy Spirit? I thought First John two twenty seven says you need not that any man teach you, but the Holy Spirit. That the Spirit of God they, it teacheth you all things. That we're all of the same anointing in that. If they are truly born again, then God's going to guide them the right direction. You can always be there for them, but there's no need to follow up because following up with people is basically harassment. It's a harassing manner to pressure them through peer pressure to come to church as if their constant monitoring of these people is what's going to save them. It's not. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse 6 it says, Now we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye withdraw your withdraw yourselves from every brother that walketh disorderly and not after the tradition which he received of us. If they are not doing the traditions that we were received of in the New Testament scripture, they want to they want to adopt all these other worldly traditions and bring them to the church. Did the Bible say be good friends with them, stay yoked up with them, try to convince them, try to reason with them. Is that what that just said? Or did it say, withdraw yourselves from every brother that walketh disorderly and not after the tradition which he received from us? So you have to decide. You have to make it a choice. As for me and my house, what will we do? Will we serve the Lord or will we choose to do what's convenient? I mean, the constant follow-ups that they do ignore the vital importance of the Holy Spirit working within new Christians when they're, when they're born again, and that doesn't need monitoring. This philosophy behind follow-ups and altar calls comes from the same philosophy Finney held, which did not believe in the intervention of God onto the souls of men for their salvation, because Finney didn't believe in that. He believed that them being saved was like changing a tire. And so these preachers give lip service to the Holy Spirit all day long, but they actually have no faith in the truth working of the, of the Spirit because the Spirit of God does not want to work within their false methods and refuses to work within their false methods. The Spirit of God will only work within the methods He has established. Okay? And so if you want to abandon those and adopt all these worldly traditions, you're welcome to do so, but you can watch the Spirit of God leave the church. Because God's a gentleman. And as we read in Romans chapter 1, if they want all their worldly stuff, he's finally going to step aside and give you over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. The choice is yours. So if some of this hasn't made you angry yet, you are going to get more angry as we go through this, and we're going to find some uh, very interesting things as we pick up next week. We're going to talk more about some of the results that came out of the testimonies of some men who experienced this new revivalism movement happening. We'll show you the very interesting results of how it had the exact opposite of effect they were expecting. We're going to talk about some more examples of some of the false teachers out there, and then we are going to show you some of the horrible results of death and injury that have happened from people claiming to be faith healers at these revivals when they are not. So we'll pick up on that on part three next week. Did anybody have any questions or comments about anything we just talked about before we close? Well, thanks for joining us, everybody, this week. And may our Lord Jesus Christ bless you all as you seek to glorify him and all that you say and do. And keep on studying his word. And God willing, we will see you next week.